If you're new to gardening, then things like seed packages can be kind of overwhelming. Today, we're going to take a look at seed packages, what's on them and what's important, what do you need to know, and what stuff is there that's just a nice to have. If you're new around here, then hi, I'm Kiri. On this channel, we talk about all things microhomesteading from growing indoors hydroponically to growing outdoors in the garden and other ways you can become more self-sufficient and reduce your reliance on the grocery store. So there's a lot of things that can feel overwhelming when you're just getting started growing food for the first time. Or even if you've done it for a little bit, maybe you've used starts in the past, the plants you can just get from the box stores or the nurseries. Maybe you want to branch out and start growing from seeds now, which I would always recommend because you get so much more variety, but it can be a bit daunting. So I thought it would be a good thing to go through seed packages. So I went through and grabbed a whole bunch that I have in my collection. If you've watched any of my other videos, you know I get most of my seeds now from Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds, but I found a whole bunch that I'd had from years ago. Some of these, <laughs> these ones were supposed to be uh, so by December 2013. So they're old, but they will serve a purpose for today. So basically today we're just going to look at the different packages, the different pieces of information that they have on them, and we'll kind of go through a whole list of all the pieces of information. Well, maybe not all, but a large sum of the pieces of information you may or may not see on seed packages because they definitely don't all have the same information. I dream of a day where a company starts putting all the relevant information on. That would be really nice. With that said though, pretty much all the information you're going to need to go from seed to harvest will be found on the package. If not, you can always do some Googling and find out any information that has not been included. So we'll start with my favorite Baker Creek packages. And one of the things you're always gonna find on there is the type of plant. So this is a bok choy. The next thing that you would find most likely is the variety that it is. This one is the Hedu Tiny. We're gonna go through this in rapid fire because there's a lot. You may also see the Latin name. In this case, it is Brassica Rapa. So in terms of naming, those are the three things that you might be finding on there. So another thing you'll see is the number of seeds. In this case, it is minimum 200. So the number of seeds is gonna vary greatly depending on the type of plant that you are growing. In this case, the tiny hedu bok choy or the ones like say carrots, those ones are gonna, you're gonna find that you get a lot more seeds. One thing that I've noticed is just me, but it seems to be the things that are one to one ratio, you get more seeds of. So one lettuce seed gives you one lettuce, one tiny hedu bok choy gives you one tiny hedu bok choy, as opposed to something like a tomato, where one seed is going to potentially give you pounds of tomatoes. Another thing that you might find on a package is calling out whether it's organic or heirloom or hybrid or open pollinated. So in this case, on these cucumbers, we can see that it calls out right at the top that it is organic. Let's see if we have another one here that calls out something like that. Um, yes, so on this one from row seven seeds, it is calling out that it is an F1 hybrid. This one here also says certified organic. Sometimes they will say heirloom. Uh, this one here is also calling out that it is a hybrid. And I did have one from uh, row seven seeds that said open pollinated, but I don't know where I've put it. Organic versus hybrid versus open pollinated versus heirloom. They're not indicating good or bad. It's just giving you a choice to know. If something is a hybrid that is not bad, we'll be able to grow food from seeds saved from hybrid plants. It just won't be true to type. So say you save a hybrid tomato seed. The tomato that you're gonna get in the next year, it's not gonna look like what you saved it from it's still gonna be a tomato and you can still eat it and it's not gonna be bad. It'll just be different. Whereas if something is open pollinated, that means that if you save the seeds, the plant that you grow in the next year will be true to type. Heirlooms are always open pollinated. And the differentiator with heirlooms is that they come with a story. They have to have been around for, I believe it's somewhere between 50 and 100 years. I don't remember off the top of my head. They have to have been preserved for a long period of time. And like I said, they usually come with an epic story. Personally, I try to grow, for the most part, only heirlooms because I love preserving those seeds and those stories and being able to share it with you guys and with other people. Now, all heirlooms are open pollinated, but not all open pollinated varieties are heirlooms. Basically, I have some from row seven seeds, 
Uh, again, not these ones because these are the hybrids, but I have some that are open pollinated. So all that means is they've taken a hybrid, so they've created a new type and they have managed to stabilize it so that it does become true to type and open pollinated varieties can be pollinated by the wind or by pollinators. It doesn't need any sort of manual intervention. For hybrids, somebody has to come along and create those hybrids every year. They're not gonna create on their own. Though sometimes that does happen in nature, but that's a whole other story. And I just wanna talk about GMO, those other seeds. No seeds that you're gonna be able to buy from the store currently are going to be GMO. They don't sell them to normal people like us, which is a good thing, but you don't have to worry about it. So some companies will put non-GMO on it. It's more of a marketing ploy than anything else, so you don't need to worry about that. And making GMO seeds costs a lot of money, so they're not just kind of selling them to normal people like us. Another thing that you might see on the seed packages is right there, it says mature height. So the mature height is going to tell you pretty much how high you can expect that plant to be once it has become fully grown. Another thing that you might see, I've really noticed it mostly on Johnny seeds. I think because they cater, they sell like massive amounts to like farms and, and that's going to be the average planting rate. So in this case, it says average planting rate is 785 seeds to produce 667 plants needed to plant a thousand foot rows. That's pretty specific. As a home gardener, you probably don't need that level of accuracy, but it is still something that you may see. Another thing that you might see is the type of soil. So in this case here, on these seeds from Vessies, it has a soil type. So it's indicating that it needs a fertile soil with a pH of six to 6.8 that has good water retention. While you could grow it in soil that is probably not fertile, that probably does not have that same pH, it doesn't mean that it won't grow. So don't go stressing yourself out and not being able to check the pH of your soil. If you can, that is always best. You can get kits online to test things like that. I'll put some in the link in the description below. I have not used them yet. It is one of the things that I want to try out this year. They're always on the package is going to give you the information that is going to be necessary for the plants to thrive and that should be 100% what we are striving for but it doesn't mean that they won't grow otherwise. I would treat it as a best case scenario and try to get to those conditions but if you don't have them and you have seeds it is better to put the seed in the ground and grow some food even if it may not grow as good as it potentially could if you had given it everything that would make for ideal conditions. Another thing that you might see on the seed package is some planting instructions talking about how to sow it and when to sow it. So in this case on the Baker Creek seeds it is right there and it pretty much says Best planted in cool spring or fall conditions and sow in place. So this one's ideally gonna have the seeds planted directly outside. We are not going to start them indoors. You will see other seeds that might talk about starting them indoors a certain amount of days before your last frost date. Last frost dates are really important. More important, people tend to talk more about hardiness zones and less about frost dates. And honestly, it should probably be the other way around. I'm in zone five for hardiness zone. There's gonna be other people that are in zone five and their last frost dates are gonna be completely different. So they're gonna to need to start their seeds at a completely different time. What is important is your last frost date, which is an average. It's an indicator, indicator, not guarantee of when you should be starting those seeds and when you can expect to be able to put them outside and not have a frost come and kill all your new plant babies. I'll put a link down below to my spring planting guide and it'll have a page in there for figuring out what your last frost date is and also figuring out your hardiness zone and you, and you can use that to plan when you should be starting your seeds. It is not a guarantee, so always err on the side of caution and look at your forecast for the next 10 days or 14 days or whatever it is before you go to put things outside. But that's a whole other video. Keep an eye on what's there for the planting instructions. Is it something that does not like to be transplanted? A lot of squash get very sensitive with their roots so they would prefer to be planted outside. If you're somewhere that has a shorter growing season like I do, you kind of have to start them indoors in order to have enough time to get them outside. But there are certain things you can do to mitigate that and not shock their roots. I was using cow pots. I will put a link in the description below to where I got the cow pots. I will also put a link up above to my kind of video talk talking about using the cow pots, which are made with cow poop, but they don't smell. So don't worry about that. 
I digress. Those planting instructions are very important. You don't want to go and start a squash inside, keep potting it up, traumatize the roots, then you've transplanted outside too soon, then it dies, it's stunted. Definitely pay attention to those and try to adhere to those as much as possible. There are certain things you may want to start inside, but you may also see other instructions that say if you start indoors, do it at this point in time. If you're going to direct sow, do it at that point in time. Another one, again, with the squash or the melon, something like that, if you're going to start them indoors, it's going to have to be so many weeks before your last frost but if you plant it outdoors it's going to be when the soil temperature reaches a certain point at some point i want to do a test maybe i'll do it this year because i've heard that things planted outside tend to catch up pretty quickly so it'd be really interesting to do it maybe with a tomato i'll start one indoors by the planting instructions uh, and then i will transplant it out and then i will start one outdoors and we'll kind of see of the same type how it catches up so stay tuned for that video assuming i remember to do it I think I will. Okay, this next thing is very important to know. On the back of the seed packages, so you might see a sow by date, or it could be a sell by date, like this one has. Neither of those means that it is going to be bad after that date. It is just a best before, or in the case of the sell by, seeds are going to have a lower germination the older they get, but it doesn't mean they won't germinate. And certain seeds have a longer capacity to go from that date versus others. So onions, they're good for about one to two years and then you see a massive drop off in the germination rate. Other things that are bigger tend to last a bit longer. Tomato seeds or other ones can go longer. I actually attempted to grow some 20 year old tomato seeds. I'll put a link up above. I still have to do a follow up one to that. Spoiler alert, they didn't grow. But that's not the point. There's also Luke from MI Gardener who was able to bring back the giant crimson tomato. The seeds that he used were like 85 or 87 years old. So things are possible. But do not go and throw out seeds because that date is in the past. Try them. Longer from that date, then you're going to want to sow it a bit more heavily just to increase your chances. But you'd be surprised what grows. And while we're talking about dates, this one also has a packed for date. So that was kind of like when they were intending to sell it for. Doesn't indicate that it will be bad after that. Another important thing is saying where something is frost hardy or not. In the case of the tiny Hedu bok choy, they are not frost hardy. Things that are frost hardy are going to be able to be planted out sooner in the spring when there's still that chance of frost or to grow later into the fall and winter when things are going to get colder. The things that are frost tender are the things you're going to want to plant in between those two frost dates. When your last frost date is in the spring and when your first frost date is in the fall. Also things that are frost hardy are good candidates for doing winter sowing. I just recently tried this for the very first time and I'll put a link up to that above if you want to check out my inaugural attempt at winter sowing. You may also see a temperature that talks about the ideal germination temperature and that is something where if you're using a heat mat you can kind of control it and then it will help to increase germination. Again if you're not at that temperature it doesn't necessarily mean that it will not germinate but you are going to have the best chance at germination if you keep it within that range. There's a lot of information on these. Honestly the Johnny Seeds packages probably have the most information on them. You may see some packages that actually have a map on the back and show you where the ideal planting area is. None of the ones I have here have that. If any of the ones you have do have that, that's a really good thing too to let you know where they're going to thrive. Again, doesn't mean they won't grow where you are. Plants don't care where you live. They don't know where you live either. All they care about is whether their needs are being met. In the case of flowers too, they your packages might indicate bloom time. If you're planting flowers that you may want to have it so you constantly have blooms in your garden. You may want to stagger things that bloom at different times. So there's always something beautiful in the garden there for pollinators. Another thing you might see on a package is seed depth. And that is going to be important in knowing how deep in the soil you are going to place your plant. So this is important because every seed has some stored energy energy in it. It's enough energy to let the seed germinate and to create the first leaves, the cotyledons, which are not true leaves, to get out and to start generating energy for the plant so that it can continue to grow. So if you plant the seed too deep, it might use up all its energy before it's had the chance to break the soil and then you're not going to see a plant form. 
a general rule of thumb is you want to plant it twice as deep as the seed is wide. So something like a pea is going to go a lot deeper than something like a carrot seed. Okay, so on this one, they're calling out the difference between seed spacing and plant spacing. So the seed spacing is going to be how far apart you want the seeds, whereas the plant spacing is once they actually get going, you're gonna try and thin them so they're further apart. Now again, this is one of those general like guidelines. There's not a lot of hard and fast rules in gardening. So that's another thing that can kind of trip people up when you're first getting started. Plants want to grow. Life will find a way. These are again things that will let it thrive. But if you look at a pack of radishes, they're going to tell you to thin them to a certain spacing. I tried last year for the first time multi-sowing, which pretty much is jamming a bunch of seeds into a small space. And I actually had the best radishes that I've ever grown. And it was the first time I ever got almost all of them to form the little bulbs on them. Before that, a lot of my radishes had been like spindly. I had put five to six seeds in each cell for radishes and they grew fantastic, which is not what the seed package would tell you. So take it as a guide and then play around and don't be scared to experiment in your garden. Another thing that you might see on packages is talking about disease resistance. This one just says that the plants are disease resistant on certain other ones. And I was trying to see if any of them had it here. It might tell you what ones they are resistant to. You tend to see that more on the hybrids because that's kind of one of the thing, one of the reasons why they have been hybridized is so that they can impart maybe flavor from one of the parent plants and disease resistance for another, giving you essentially the best of both worlds. The seed packages may tell you something about the watering needs. In this case, it's not very specific, but it says moderate. So I guess not a lot of water, not too little. Some of them may give you more specific information on the watering needs as well. So here's another one talking about the water. So it says ample moisture required. Also in the same one with the water, it talks about the light requirements and it says will tolerate a slight shading. So it may call out that some plants need full sun or it might tell you the amount of hours of sun they need. Lettuce is more of a shade plant as opposed to a tomato or a cucumber that's going to thrive in a lot of light. If you put the tomatoes in the shady part of the garden and you put the lettuce in the sunny part of the garden, they're not gonna grow as well as if you had flipped that around. Another thing that may be called out on the plants is the days to sprouting or it could say germination time. Time, and that's going to pretty much just tell you from when you pop the seed in the soil to when you see proof of life basically what that range is going to be and if you get outside of that range and you haven't seen anything happen it doesn't mean that they won't be sprouting temperature and moisture are going to affect germination so if your house is cold if you're starting the seeds inside versus having it on a heat mat you're going to see differences there this was a cool thing i haven't seen this on any other seed packages i noticed this on here it says it is container friendly which is kind of nice if you don't have a lot of space for this one it says seven plants per 30 centimeters or container. That is kind of a neat thing to see. Another thing that I'll call out down here is this one says Origin USA. Why is that important? Where the seeds were grown and created is going to impact potentially how they do. It's always good to preferably have seeds that are from where you live. So for me, getting seeds from Baker Creek in uh, Missouri in the United States, they're not necessarily going to do as well for me here in Canada as opposed to somebody that's growing them directly in Missouri. So one of the things you can do is to locally adapt your plants. I did a blog post on this. I will link that down in the description below. But basically, I can take these plants from Baker Creek and I can grow them and some of them will grow. The ones that grow are going to be best suited to my conditions and and then if I let those go to seed, I can save the seeds from them. And then those ones start to become locally adapted to where I live. And it, the ones that grow are going to be the best suited. So that's always something that's good to do. It ties in with seed saving, which saves you money, which is why for me, I always like to use heirloom seeds preferably, or at least open pollinated because it allows me to do that seed saving. I'll put a link to the video up above that I did on that, which saves me money and locally adapts my plants, which will then lead to bigger harvests in the long run. So it's kind of win-win. Another thing that you might see is days to maturity or days to harvest on this package. It is called out as days to harvest and it's telling me 80 days. Now this is one of those things that's consistently inconsistent. It could be 80 days from putting that seed in the ground or 
it could be 80 days from transplanting out, or it could be 80 days from germination. So again, take it as a guide. It's kind of a rough estimate. It's a good idea to track the plants in your garden and see when you're planting, when you're transplanting, kind of keeping all that data. And then you can kind of narrow it down and find out how that tends to go in your own garden, but you won't know that straight away. So you can use this as a guide and it'll, it'll give you an idea of when you can expect the plant to be mature. Another thing that can be called out is whether it is an annual plant versus a perennial plant versus a biennial plant versus a self-seeding annual plant. So what does that mean? An annual plant is typically something that you are going to plant every single year, but that can also depend on where you live. For most people, you grow peppers as an annual. If you live somewhere that's very mild, you might be able to overwinter them and keep them going for years. But if you some live somewhere that's very warm all the time, they can actually be grown as a perennial. And a perennial is a plant that comes back year over year over year. Then you have the self-seeding annual, which pretty means it is an annual, but it drops enough seeds that you're going to get new plants in that same spot next year. Year. So it kind of acts like a perennial, but it's not. And then a biennial is something that's going to do stuff every two years. So I believe hollyhocks are a biennial and you, the first year you get the plant growth and in the second year you tend to get the flowers. Almost done. You may see harvesting information and that's going to tell you kind of basically how to harvest your plant. So in this case it says, as small heads form, break over or tie together outer leaves to protect the head from discoloring. This is on a cauliflower. Harvest cauliflower when heads are firm, still tightly clustered and adequately sized. I guess that depends on how big you want it. So that is some harvesting information. Talking about the disease resistance, again, as I mentioned, this one is the F1 hybrid. And it says here on the back that this one is powdery mildew resistant. So check your packages for that sort of information. You may also see some general information. In this case, this one says comment here on the back of these delphinium seeds. And basically it just says good for backgrounds and borders, but does require staking. So it's just a little bit of extra information. Another thing that you might see, especially on the Baker Creek seeds or things that are heirlooms, they may give you a little bit of an indication of the story. This one um, says that it has been grown first in the small Hong Kong village of Hak Tao. That's just a little bit of information. Some of the other ones, I don't have them here, unfortunately, will give you more of the actual story, which is again, one of the reasons I love heirlooms. They may mention on there any fertilization needs. So again, on these cucumbers, this one says fertilize with natural resources such as compost or manure. This one actually is pretty good. It actually has some companion planting information on it right there. And it says plant near beans, peas, tomatoes, cabbage, and lettuce. Companion planting is good, but that's another video. All right, so that was information overload. <laughs> Hopefully you guys found that helpful and you're feeling a little bit more confident of navigating the difference information that you might see on seed packages and understanding what it means and how you can use that information. So until next time, don't forget to enjoy the little things and go out there and make food grow. Bye guys.